morning, and thank you for getting up early this first day of AEP. We at Zoetis are really happy that you got out of bed and are here for an exciting program. I'm Dr. Jackie Boggs. I'm a senior veterinarian with the Technical Service Department at Zoetis, and I'm happy to be joined by our panel of experts today, uh, Ms. Denise Ferris, Dr. Susan Moore, Dr. Bonnie Rush, as well as my colleague, Dr. Kevin Hankins, who will be serving as our panel moderator. Please allow me to introduce our panelists. Denise Ferris is a, has earned her Doctor of Law from the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and is currently of counsel with the law firm Perry and Trent in Kansas City. She enjoys a national reputation in equine veterinary and pharmaceutical regulatory law. Also, Dr. Do uh, Bonnie Rush, she earned her veterinary degree from The Ohio State University. She completed an internship at North Carolina State University and completed her equine internal medicine residency at The Ohio State University. She is currently serving as the Interim Dean of the College of Veterinary Medicine at Kansas State University. And finally, Dr. Susan Moore, she earned her Medical Technology degree at Kansas State University and later earned her certification as a specialist in blood banking by the American Society of Clinical Pathologists. <clears throat> she earned her PhD in pathobiology at Kansas State University. She's board, cer board certified as a high complexity laboratory director by the American Board of Bioanalysis and currently serves as a laboratory director of the Rabies Lab at the College of Veterinary Medicine at Kansas State University and has served on the World Health Organization Rabies Expert Consultation Committee. And now I'll turn it over to um, my colleague, Dr. Kevin Hankins, who is also a, a senior technical service veterinarian at Zoetis. And we're glad you're here to learn about rabies and to raise awareness about how equine rabies impacts uh, our community. All right. Thanks, Dr. Boggs. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming here this morning. We'll direct the questions to each of them individually. I'll start with Dr. Moore. So can you give us a brief overview of rabies and how you would diagnose rabies? So rabies, uh, I think most people know, is an acute progressive encephalitis. Um, it is believed to affect most mammals, and it is 100% fatal once signs appear. Uh, the uh, reservoirs uh, in the United States, as opposed to most of the world where it's dog rabies, uh, reservoirs in the United States are wildlife reservoirs, and with variants that um, circulate in specific uh, wildlife reservoirs, which are typically um, raccoon, skunk, fox, and bat. Um, the way you diagnose it uh, would be strictly through uh, analysis uh, of the brain tissue, the brain stem, and cerebellum particularly. Um, and that is through the, the classic uh, gold standard test, the direct fluorescent antibody test. So it has to be on brain tissue. Dr. Moore, you, you mentioned uh, the tissue samples that you have to get. So what are you looking in those tissue samples? What are you specifically looking for for yeah. rabies? Um, so we're particularly just looking for presence of the rabies virus. So the, the direct fluorescent antibody test, um, you, you put the brain tissue on a slide, uh, a brain impression, and then you stain it with a fluorescent dye that has an antibody um, directed to uh, the nuclear protein, which is the protein which is in the highest amount um, in, in the tissue from rabies. And we look at it under a fluorescence microscope. So basically, look at the brain tissue. If there's virus present, then we diagnose it as positive for rabies. So there's always a question that comes up about tactile hair. Is, is, is that anything to look at? No. <laughs> the okay. only way uh, to, to definitively diagnose is on the brain tissue. So Dr. Rush, you, ma you mentioned a few things about clinical signs. So what's the prognosis horse with rabies? Like Dr. Moore said, 100% fatal once they start to show clinical signs. There's a lot of variability in how quickly it will be fatal. The average is four and a half days, um, but it could be, it certainly can be shorter and it can certainly be longer than four and a half days before, um, before they, they die. Great. All right, Denise, I promise not to tell any lawyer jokes, okay? All right, so, so the AAP considers rabies to be a, a core disease to vaccinate for. Right. 
So as a veterinarian, if what are the implications or the legal ramifications if we as veterinarians would tell a client, you don't need to vaccinate for rabies? Yeah, fairly significant. And if there's a point I want to take away, it's this. Uh, veterinarians are measured by what we call a standard of practice in the industry, but when you're dealing with the zoonotic diseases, that standard is heightened significantly. So uh, when a core vaccine is identified, it's because it's, it's been identified by your association as one requiring that highest level of care. So at a minimum, your standard of care would be defined as being able to advise your client of what the vaccination is, why there's a need for it. And then in those states where you're allowed to get a waiver, which is usually disfavored, to be sure that you have it documented to the nth degree. And again, remember, in the states that suggest those waivers uh, or suggest the vaccination, uh, a waiver is going to be very, very strongly looked at in a negative light by a court if you end up there. So, Dr. Moore, uh, rabies, is it geographically specific or are there areas where they don't have rabies? Or? Right. Um, so, uh, all the rabies diagnostic uh, results go to the CDC and they make um, the rabies maps to show where rabies occurs. And in the United States, we know from this data that uh, the raccoon rabies strain is primarily along the East Coast. Um, from the coast to the Appalachian Mountains, and then in the middle of the country, um, where we are in Texas, and then all the way up uh, to the Dakotas, is skunk rabies. Uh, north central skunk, um, kind of down toward Nebraska and Kansas, and then south central skunk. And then there's pockets of fox rabies um, in Texas and Arizona, New Mexico, California, and Alaska. So you can see where there's very specific strains. It's all uh, the type one classic rabies virus, but they are varied in um, their genetic imprint. So you can tell the difference. They've adapted to these specific reservoir strains, and, and this is where they are throughout the country. So all, all the different strains can infect horses there. That's right. Okay. A and what it doesn't show in that map uh, is where bat rabies is, and bat rabies have been found um, throughout the United States, except in Hawaii. Hawaii doesn't have any rabies, but otherwise, and that's why people need to remember, that map kind of makes it look like there's areas where rabies hasn't been detected, and that's not true. There's bat rabies um, all over the United States. So, Dr. Rush, could you tell us a little bit about the clinical presentation of rabies and what your experience has been? We'll look at a range of clinical signs associated with rabies, and, and this miniature horse, we, we thought it was a TL fracture, so we, were, we did radiographs, we did a spinal tap, we sent CSF to the lab. You can see this little miniature horse is um, completely paralyzed behind and, and very functional up front, and uh, it's really not, not exactly what you're expecting, although that's not a, a terribly uncommon presentation, but I wanted to show how bright and alert this this little horse is, um, and died of rabies two days later. We were just surprised that this was rabies, and we probably shouldn't have been. We just see it so infrequently. This horse was under uh, rabies protocol. Um, I'd say 20, uh, 20 horses go under rabies protocol for every horse we have that, that actually has rabies. Um, but that one, we, rabies was certainly not our number one differential diagnosis. Um, Susan, do you want to talk about this video? There's a fox, and it's going to, this is a rabid fox, and you can see the unusual behavior of what it's going to do in a minute here. Um, uh, so the horse is obviously not concerned and or hasn't noticed it yet. The fox bites the horse in the really, um, in the tissue right at the hoof, and um, there's a rabies exposure right there. Luckily, what the, the horses were vaccinated in this video. And, and the thing that's interesting about um, when the clinical signs start is the virus has to enter a peripheral nerve and travel up to the central nervous system, and it travels pretty slowly. So if you're bit on a distal limb, 
it's going to be a pretty long time until it makes it to the central nervous system. If you're bit on your face, then it's going to move a lot more quickly. But in this case, it would have been a, a pretty long period of time before this horse actually showed clinical signs, had the horse not been vaccinated. Yeah, and there's um, <coughs> reports of incubation periods being years. So um, it's a wide, wide range. Typically, it's one to three months. It really depends on the dose, um, and where it was bitten, and the strain and host factors. This case is a, is a case that looks much more like what you would expect, um, where we're all standing outside of the stall saying, I think it's rabies. <coughs> Don't you think it's rabies? I think it's rabies. It's a lot clearer in this case that um, it's, it's probably going to be, uh, be rabies in this case. And of course, in, in no case that I'm going to show you did we identify a, a bite wound in any case. In the, the reason I want to show this video of this horse is, um, is seizuring is listed as a clinical sign of rabies. And certainly they seizure, but seizure is very end stage. Uh, when you, you wouldn't have a horse that seized and then stood up and had a reasonably normal interictal period. Um, when they start seizing, it's very close to the end. So for, for the horse that presents to you for seizure, um, rabies wouldn't be at the top of your list. Um, it, unless it, 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 this horse has pharyngeal paralysis and is making a pretty loud sound when it's breathing. Um, I would, I would say, uh, this horse you can see came in with its head in the corner of the trailer. I've had more cases with the pedoencephalopathy present with their head in the corner of the trailer than I have rabies, but um, certainly you have to treat them all as if as if they had rabies, and that horse did. Um, also, this horse is vocalizing and has pharyngeal paralysis. This is a four-month-old bull. This one also caught us a bit off guard. Um, not entirely. It was on rabies protocol, but we thought it was going to be a skull fracture. That, that was really our expectation for this case. Um, but progressed, this, this horse progressed very rapidly from standing and uh, unable to swallow was the presenting complaint to recumbent in what you see here was about 16 hours, went very, very quickly. Uh, this case, uh, Dr. Reed will recognize, and I just want to say from the start that everybody had big hair in the 80s. I was not the only one. <laughs> A lot of hairspray. Uh, but the reason I show this horse is um, I, I don't think at this stage that I, that I suspected rabies at all. This horse had some spinal ataxia, urinary incontinence, and and intention tremor. Those were the clinical signs. And we spent um, a lot of time with this horse. We did a spinal tap. Um, they had a, little, a lot of lymphocytes. That should have been a clue to us, but we actually thought it might be lymphoma. Um, and this horse was pretty stable for nine days with these clinical signs. And you can see that intention tremor right there at the end. And, and the thing that was important to us about um, about this case was not only the non-progression, but the lymphocytic, um, the lymphocytic infl inflammation in the central nervous system that, that made us think maybe it was something else. This horse's brain was negative. This horse's spinal cord was positive, and that happens in horses, where you really need to make sure that you submit spinal cord as well as brain, because in this case, we would have missed it. And there are other published cases where it would have been missed had the spinal cord not gone in. Susan, do you want to talk about that? It has to be a full cross-section of the brain, uh, because the virus uh, travels up um, through the neurons and may just pass through one, one side of the brain stem and the spinal cord. So if we get half of a brain, you, we cannot make a diagnosis on half of a brain it will be, the result will be um, unsuitable. And then that will be just an assumption that the, it's positive as far as post-exposure decisions. Um, but it's usually found in the cerebellum and, of course, in the spinal column and the brain stem. And we need to have those tissues. But as, as Dr. Rush mentioned, that in horses and in um, cows, the spinal column is important because of uh, the way it travels up. Uh, here's an agrobody here, uh, and here's an agrobody, and you can see the lymphocytic infl inflammation, but there's the agrobody from the case that you just saw. Uh, I wanted to show a video of a, of a horse that um, could easily be mistaken for rabies. This horse has bilateral facial nerve paralysis. This is a youngster, 14-month-old, poor horse. 
and um, this horse has has one of the clinical signs that I would say should always make you be thinking about rabies, and that's hyperesthesia. If I touch this horse on his left front forearm, um, she's really, really unhappy with me. And uh, we already know this horse has West Nile, um, but it, it really is, uh, this horse was not trying to bite me because she was mean, um, but she really just thought that I was going to touch that right forearm where she was hyperesthetic. So hyperesthesia, fever, a single limb that they can't use, those are really my triggers for rabies where I'm really concerned about rabies. Any horse that is um, hyper-responsive or has, um, has asymmetric clinical signs, I'm going to be pretty worried about rabies. Okay, so it looks like it's hard to diagnose, I mean, to get a definitive diagnosis. Uh, Denise, so when we look at legal implications, mm -hmm. what to a veterinarian, if, if I go out and I misdiagnose, mm -hmm. What's the implications to myself? Yeah, so you're somewhat perched on the horns of the dilemma in that you can't make a, a conclusive diagnosis unless you have brain tissue. Um, also know that there are no reported cases yet where an equine veterinarian has been held liable, but there are many, many cases out there that deal with a veterinarian's liability for small animal treatment. Um, Understand that if you have a patient present with any symptoms that could potentially be rabies, then your duty is triggered to treat it accordingly, um, to advise the owner of the animal what their potential exposure has been. You don't want to be the doctor, but to recommend to them that they seek treatment. Uh, you do have an immediate responsibility to document in the record the suspicion. You probably have the obligation that if you suspect it, that you implement the quarantine procedures immediately. You find out if the horse has been vaccinated, and if it's been vaccinated, you implement that protocol. If it's not been vaccinated, then at that point, you need to discuss euthanasia or a six-month quarantine with all of the trimmings that go with that. And again, I can't emphasize enough, you must document your record very specifically. If you just simply put in your record, discuss euthanasia with nothing else, there is uh, several cases out there that deal with that in the context of a dog or a cat, and that did not go well for the veterinarian. You have to be very, very clear with the client. So Dr. Moore, if uh, I have a horse that, as a horse owner or a veterinarian that is exposed to a, a rabid animal. What steps should I take as a veterinarian? Well, as, as Denise mentioned, it's going to depend on whether the um, animal is vaccinated or not, uh, but the, it needs to be reported um, to the local health authority. And then if the animal is vaccinated, then it can be boosted and then uh, observed. Um, but if it's not vaccinated, then the decisions are um, euthanasia or the six-month um, quarantine. Okay. So does that vary state by state, or yes, is it pretty uh, general? The, the, the Compendium for Animal uh, Rabies Control and Prevention gives recommendations to the states, and it's a guideline uh, for state regulations, but they can vary state to state, so it's always important to first uh, report it to the local authorities and find out what the, the regulations are. Denise, so what's does liability insurance, the liability insurance that we as veterinarians carry, does it, what does it do with rabies? Understand your professional liability coverage will cover you for what is deemed negligent acts. Um, but the reason you all hate attorneys is that we always say what those facts are kind of depends. The facts and the law depends. Um, the more that a horse would present with signs that most of your peers would say you knew or should have known that that was most likely rabies, and the less you do to address it as such, the closer you get to stepping over the line between ordinary negligence into what we call gross negligence or even intentional acts. Your ordinary negligence will be covered by your insurance, your gross negligence, and your intentional acts will not. Million dollar question. What's the best way to prevent rabies? Vaccination. Number one, uh, 
horses should be vaccinated because they are um, an animal that's uh, uniquely uh, at risk of rabies because uh, many of them are housed outside uh, around the reservoirs for rabies. Uh, so even uh, barns aren't uh, impervious to uh, a skunk or a raccoon or a fox or a bat uh, uh, getting in. Uh, but if a horse is vaccinated, then the vaccination is the vaccine is very good at preventing rabies. Uh, rab we like to say rabies is 100% fatal, but vaccination is almost 100% protective. So what would you tell me if, if I came up and said, I don't know if my horse is exposed, but I saw a skunk out in the daytime? Make sure they're vaccinated, <laughs> because you do not know whether they're going to be bitten. And as Dr. Rush mentioned, in many of the cases, the report of a bite or even evidence of a bite is not there in these rabies cases. So you're not with your horse, not like with your dog or your cat, where you may know um, if it's a, a companion animal, but you don't know whether that uh, horse has been bitten or been exposed right. um, to a rabid animal. So Dr. Rush, the AAP considers rabies to be one of the the core diseases for vaccination. Uh, in your opinion, why is that? And, and also what horses should be vaccinated for rabies? Everybody should be vaccinated for rabies. Core vaccines are the vaccines that um, prevent diseases that have serious consequences, have hum some have human health significance, um, and the vaccine is effective. So the other core vaccines are uh, Eastern, Western, uh, tetanus and rabies and West Nile. Those are the core vaccines. And for me, I think about a horse standing in a pasture, not, not exposed to any other horses. Um, those core vaccines prevent those horses from, from those types of diseases. Eastern, Western, tetanus, West Nile, rabies. Those are the core vaccines and it, it's clear why they, why they should be. So Dr. Moore, I, we touched on it briefly, but are the guidelines for equine rabies cases from your point of view, are they standard across states or is it going to depend on, should they check with their individual state? I, I think they st still should check um, because one, you, you get it reported and um, since it's zoonotic disease, you involve public health, which includes uh, medical personnel, veterinary um, and, and epidemiologists. And it, it takes um, a lot of people to decide how to treat a case. And so, though they vary a little bit, in general, um, they're, they're going to follow the compendium. And if you look at the compendium, you can see the general guidance um, for, for horses, but you still need to check uh, with the local authority. One of the things I think it's important for all of you to remember as a practitioner is how a plaintiff's lawyer would attack it given the difference in protocols state to state to state. Um, we would be looking at, first of all, what state do you practice in and what is the prevalence of rabies within that state? That indicates whether you know or should know that the possibility of contamination is at a level. Second, we would go to your state statutes and your veterinary board regulations and the protocols that are set within that state for that animal and will we be measuring uh, whether or not you met those protocols. So I think knowing your state regulations is critically important, not only for your compliance with your state veterinary board, um, but also in terms of maintaining what your legal standard of care is and how you document that. Uh, Liability-wise, we know that there's about 32 states that require a veterinarian to administer the vaccine and to be able to purchase. There's some states that allow horse owners to purchase the rabies vaccination. What type of liability situation does that place the veterinarian in? Yeah, that can be really problematic um, because as we know, uh, attorneys and veterinarians have to work very hard at keeping their records current. You're doing a lot and sometimes your record keeping lags behind, but for the most part, you've got fairly reliable records and you're held legally accountable for having fairly reliable records. How good are most of your clients' record keeping skills? So when you have an animal that's presenting with the possibility of rabies, how difficult is it going to be for that particular owner to prove it? Um, in that particular instance, the liability chain is probably gonna start first with the individual owner 
but there is the possibility of it going back up to the veterinarian in terms of uh, was there a consultation between you and that owner with respect to how to utilize the vaccination protocols and the importance of keeping those records to where they could be obtained very quickly should they need to be produced. So one more question about vaccinated and unvaccinated. So does it differ from state to state? I know I've read that, that the horse is unvaccinated or vaccinated by a horse owner. In most states, it's considered unvaccinated. Mm -hmm. So does it vary from state to state or is it pretty consistent as far as if a horse owner vaccinates their it does vary state to state. There's a uh, website called Rabies Aware that has a map um, in uh, most of the states. There's information on uh, that particular question is who can vaccinate and who can le legally vaccinate. And I was looking at it and it's not as black and white as saying who can vaccinate and who cannot vaccinate because some of the language is unclear or... Um, like I think it was Louisiana, it, it didn't specifically say it has to be a veterinarian, uh, but the language sort of implied it. Uh, many of them say, I would say the vast majority say a veterinarian or um, a vet tech, registered vet tech or a vet tech under the supervision, which meaning the veterinarian has to be present uh, for vaccination. The, the veterinarian is usually the one who signs the um, vaccination record and says, you know, they take responsibility for that. But it, it does vary, and, and I think Denise's point was very good, is, is some of the language is, is uh, uh, a little nebulous sometimes. Yeah. And again, I try to give you all takeaway points because it is state-by-state state specific, <coughs> but understand that when you're dealing with rabies, that's the one incidence where the law is going to be much more gentle to you if you take the most extreme measures in supervising and containing, even if it's a wrong diagnosis, even if you suspect rabies and then the animal is euthanized and turns out to be negative. The law has been very gentle to the veterinarians because of the potential of the public health risk. Go the other way and treat it very cavalierly. Uh, the law tends to be very hard on you all. We know rabies is zoonotic disease. So how concerned should we as veterinarians or humans be when they're exposed to a rabbit horse? Because rabies is fatal and um, many owners aren't vaccinated, it is really important um, to ask the questions, what was the exposure? Exposure uh, for rabies is usually a bite. Uh, but it also can be contamination of an open wound or mucous membranes from saliva or neural tissue. Um, so owners need, or whoever was around that horse, uh, the questions need to be asked of them, you know, what was the exposure? And, and veterinarians play a key role in um, asking those questions and bringing that information forward. So as a veterinarian, what do you feel your responsibilities are as far as educating that client? Yes, I think it's important to, to talk about how important rabies vaccine is and, and that your horse is going to be exposed, even a horse that's living in a barn. Uh, I know firsthand um, I had a little skunk nest underneath our feed bin for a while. Um, but even if you're in a barn, it, it doesn't mean you can't have something wander in, a bat, a skunk, a, a a raccoon, um, that doesn't prevent your horse from being exposed. And the chance that of you knowing that your horse was exposed, that fox video is so unusual, the chance that you know your animal was exposed is really low. Uh, I think when you've got a horse with rabies, uh, it's really important when we put a horse under rabies protocol, we put a sign on the stall. Everybody that walks in the stall puts their name and phone number there. Uh, we've got the uh, CDC regulations of what constitutes an exposure right outside the stall. Um, everybody's wearing gloves. We've recently added that everybody's wearing goggles because of the, the possibility of saliva splashing into the eye. Um, and recognize, I talked about tapping a few of these horses. Ideally, you don't tap a horse that has rabies, but they don't all come with a sign stamped on the side, this is a rabies case. And, and you're thinking a lot of other things besides rabies. So whenever you're doing a spinal tap, it's important to be wearing goggles and even some protection over your mouth. Uh, 
and you mar need to mark the samples that are going to the lab as rabies suspect because CSF is a rich source of the virus and you want to make sure that the personnel in the lab are taking the same precautions. So we put it on the, on the form and we go to the lab or call the lab and say this is a rabies suspect. Um, please keep that in mind while handling the sample. Ideally, if we really suspect rabies, we wouldn't consider tapping that horse. We wouldn't do it. Any other things about uh, liability from the education standpoint then, Denise? Uh, yeah, you know, this is just a little bit vet school reminder, but remember that your duty arises when the BCPR is created, your vet client patient relationship. Before that, you don't have a duty. As soon as that VCPR is created, now you have a duty. Um, I would say in terms of vaccinations, if you're providing annual vaccinations, as you mostly do for your clients, uh, at that point in time, it would be prudent for you to advise them, particularly where those vaccines have now been recommended by the AVMA, the AAEP, and specifically by the NASPHB for horses. That's a good time to advise them. So now we've, we've talked about, you know, diagnostics, zoonotic potential, what you should do in the case of a rabies case. So now let's say you do have a rabies case as a veterinarian. Now there's going to be post-exposure costs. I mean, to the veterinarian, to the client, to your clinical staff, how's that handled from a veterinary standpoint? Yeah. Who's going to pay for all that? Well, interestingly enough, there is a case called Fry in the state of Virginia where they dealt explicitly with that under a workers' compensation claim. And it is considered a, an employee exposure. If it arises out of the functions that they're performing in the workplace, that would be an employee exposure. Uh, that means you as the employer, A, have got a responsibility if it's even, and you know, the thing that's hard is you can't confirm it's rabies. You've just got to go all on the suspicion. But if you suspect that it's rabies, you should be implementing all of the protective gear, every person that's handling it. If you're dealing with a lot of rabies within your clinic, you should probably be requiring the annual vaccinations for your employees. And then last but not least, you are probably responsible for any of the post-exposure treatments, and that can be fairly significant. So Dr. Moore, what's been the most impactful thing you've witnessed or you can take away or give us a takeaway message for, for everybody about rabies? Yeah, I think um, all in all, uh, rabies, because it doesn't happen very often, especially in the United States, and, but it involves um, veterinarians, uh, physicians, public health, and laboratorians, all professionals, all people who know what they're doing, who are very educated and um, aware. But it does take all, all four. Because it doesn't happen very often, sometimes it can be missed by you know one or the other, or the procedures may not be exactly known, and it, take, it really takes everybody. And so if there is a suspect case, it really is important to notify every, every piece of that um, to, to make sure that it's being covered adequately. You've seen a lot of rabies cases, been around it. So what's, what's been the most impactful thing you've seen from a clinician standpoint? Um, we get better every time, but even though we have protocol, even though we, we have a fair amount of experience, we make a mistake every single time. It's a different mistake, it's a new mistake. And so if you if you don't if you haven't thought about it ahead of time and you haven't seen a lot of cases um, and you don't plan ahead, um, you're gonna make more mistakes. And as much as we plan, we still in the in the postmortem so to speak of what went on during that case and we do that every single time. We completely review and interview everybody associated with the case, we, we always find that we've made some mistake and it changes our protocol the next time. And so being, being really diligent on the front end is, is important. But the case that is most fresh in my mind is the one we just saw in June was a four month old. Mm -hmm. And that foal was unable to swallow, tongues hanging out, foal is very agitated, so it's tossing its head all around, saliva is flying everywhere. Um, and not everybody had eye protection. 
And that was, that was the thing that changed in our protocol, is everybody has to have eye protection for every rabies suspect case now. Um, and it should have been apparent. We thought it was a skull fracture. We didn't, so they're trying to take radiographs, and the horse is throwing its head around. And um, so now eye protection is a part of what we, what we do. The expenses um, for everybody involved was, was vaccinated except one person. And so it was a two-dose series for everybody, and that cost was $600 in vaccine alone, but there were costs associated with administration, and um, the, the cost for the person who was unvaccinated was $12,000. From a legal standpoint, then, Denise, in your experience, is what's been the most impactful thing with rabies? Um, we did have an exposure at an Equifest where there was a rabid dog and two of her puppies that were basically in contact with thousands of people at that event. Um, and um, going back to what Susan said, uh, the inclination when you're in that exposure is to cover yourself. Um, but in that particular instance, all of the parties worked together very fast, very aggressively with the public health department and the local media to put notices out right away. And it's very frustrating for you all who are just wanting to practice and, and you don't have the time to be digging down. Let me give you a very simple rule of thumb. If you're presented with an exposure or a situation and you can't completely understand how you should handle it from a liability perspective, use the front page of the newspaper rule. How would you feel if what your decision today was published on the front page of the newspaper tomorrow in a worst case situation? If you follow that very common sense approach to your legal risk exposures, you're gonna find that your life becomes really simple in terms of what you should be doing, even sometimes exceeding the protocols that your industry has set. How would this look? if this turns out to be a rabies case and I didn't use the goggles. And now my entire group of, of treating uh, students have become exposed. Great, so before we open it up for questions or comments, any other key takeaways that we didn't cover? Vaccinate your horses. Okay, All right, that's a good one. All right. It's out there. It, it is out there. I think um, if you've never seen it, you're, you're surprised by that first case. Yeah, very gentle suggestion. You know, you guys are preeminent within your industry and you're attending a conference where you've got the best of the best. Maybe very gently urge the AAEP to work a little bit harder on giving you some guidelines and protocols on what a rabies informed consent form might look like or what the elements should be to where you've got a standardized form that would make it a little bit easier. Or maybe, maybe a form that would be a, a potential informed consent form, not just on rabies, but on every one of your four core vaccines. Was tighter, that was tighter work as opposed to challenge work. And um, I think until there's challenge work, I, I, I'll feel better about saying annual. Uh, the vaccine is very inexpensive. Uh, it's an easy thing to do. Um, and one of those cases, the horse that was the biting horse, um, the gray horse that you saw had been vaccinated two years, 24 months prior to presentation. Most of the horses that I showed you were unvaccinated, but that horse was uh, had been vaccinated two years prior to presentation. So um, I'm not that comfortable with saying serology. We know, we know that serology translates to protection. I'm, I'm less comfortable about saying that in a three-year window of time. It's a it's a seven seven dollar vaccine. Um, it, it makes sense to do it annually, and it gives you the opportunity to be in front of your client annually. Yeah. There's a legal element to that too, and that is what is the basic basis for um, scientific evidence that you try to present in court, and it has to be so strong that it has been established. 
um, as generally accepted within the industry. Um, I had a chance to read a recent treatise on titer work on equine rabies, and it's simply too vague at this point to meet that legal standard that would give you the protection you need in court. Yeah, no, I, I just want to add that that's um, not just in equines, but in uh, other species too. Uh, that question comes up is how does serology re relate to protection? And um, there is good evidence that a certain level does, but there's just too many variables. Um, I am a laboratorian, and I'll be the first one to say serology is variable. So before you set a standard and say this level meets, you know, means 100% protection, which is what you need in rabies, you can't do it. And there's no, no way right now with the data that we have that you can say that. Um, in humans, you know, we get vaccinated uh, when we check our titers, but the difference is we know, the people who are working with rabies know when we're exposed to, to uh, rabies, and we get a booster at that time. And animals, they're not going to tell you they got bit by a fox out in the field um, or a bat uh, bit them. Mm -hmm. So there, the, the standards aren't the same. We get that argument a lot is, well, we do it for humans. Why can't we do it for animals? Animals can't tell you they were exposed. And I think you mentioned the immune system difference between dogs, cats, horses. Right. Yeah. Right, Do dogs have a, a much stronger immune system. How, you know, if you take your dog to the dog park, you don't expect the dog to come home sick. If you take your horse to the horse show, there's a pretty good chance your horse is gonna come home sick. If you take your cattle to the feed yard, they're, they're gonna get sick. So it's a very different standard. Actually, we had that happen in Kansas. We had, uh, not for rabies, but a, a horse was highly suspected to have EHV-1, died, and the carcass disappeared before the veterinarian could get out there and make a conclusive diagnosis. Um, again, I think you have to understand that there are certain things that you can do within your discretion as a veterinarian, and then there are certain things that are taken out of your hands because of the potential impact on what we call public safety, health, and welfare. When, whenever there is a condition that can potentially be that devastating, it invokes, to use the scary words, the police power of the state. But in those instances, because the harm is so great, uh, then I think you need to make it pretty clear to your client that there is potential exposure to them and there is certainly legal exposure to you, even to the point where you can potentially uh, have your license to practice suspended or revoked. Is that a fair statement if, if I throw that to the, to the other panelists? Well, if there's exposure and the, um, the brain is not available for testing, uh, public health would look at that as a positive case. And so um, anybody that was exposed would have to undergo treatment. I but think you could lean on public health to, mm -hmm. to help you um, convince the owner. Yeah. In our hospital, everybody is vaccinated on our nickel. Every student worker, anybody that has animal contact is vaccinated and, and we, we pay for that. Students um, aren't required to be vaccinated, but um, they are strongly recommended to be vaccinated. They provide us with proof of vaccination. And um, if they are unvaccinated, and we haven't had a student in my memory that was unvaccinated, um, they are limited in the cases that they can interact with and the situations they can interact with. So um, nobody can force a needle in your arm, um, but um, we, we strongly, strongly recommend, and I'd say in 15 years, I, I don't know of a student who did not get vaccinated. And that was so important in, in, it's important in every case, but in this last case, during the postmortem, the student was taking out the spinal cord, had three layers of protection on his arm, and he pulled back and hit a, a fresh open piece of rib, and it, it went through all three layers and scratched his arm. And so fortunately, he was vaccinated, he immediately boosted, but um, you know that's that's probably the place where you're most likely to to have a problem with a horse is during the postmortem, as opposed to 
Um, CSF and postmortem are where the exposures are the most most concerning um, with the rabbit horse. No, um, it, it's common. Uh, people just with other diseases, they they look at that, uh, like hepatitis or something. But for rabies, you don't do not wait um, for serology. It doesn't matter anyway because um, whether you have a high titer or a low titer or no titer, um, the purpose of that booster is to um, you know wake up your memory cells both the cellular immunity and humoral immunity. So you need to get the booster. I'd also like to suggest there are certain states that have a higher prevalence of rabies occurrences. Those are Texas is the high, and correct me here, but Texas is highest, Oklahoma is next, and then Kansas and Pennsylvania are tied at coming in at, at third. Um, in those states, I would suggest that if you have a practice um, with a lot of animals that have got small animals around them, even if your horse barn, how many how many barn cats do you have? Mm. Uh, those would be the practices that I would suggest implementing regular vaccinations for your vet techs and the and the people that are going to be treating those animals. It would be considered unvaccinated, but how it's handled. Uh, whether it goes through the six months or something in between is really up to the the professionals who are going to be looking at that. But, but it situation. would be considered unvaccinated. It would be considered unvaccinated right. first, okay. and then how it's handled after that is case by case, is what the compendium says, and many state uh, regulations say that also. And that's one of those issues that has not been tested in the law, but you don't want to be that case. <laughs> um, don't use a bandsaw. <laughs> you need to do it with rongeurs, um, and, and you, you need spinal cord. And so that's the thing that's really hard, is your exposure is far bigger while you're doing that post-mortem. Um, and so if you can avoid it completely, if you can get the owner to transport the whole body to wherever a diagnostic lab would be that could do that for you, that would be my first recommendation. I recognize that's not always possible. Uh, and if, if the horse had a lot of cranial signs, a lot of, of, of the foramen magnum, probably it's okay to send the head, and I'd send the whole head. Um, if it's a lot of spinal cord, a limb they can't use, high limb paralysis like the mini, it's pretty important to get the spinal cord there too. Um, and I don't know that there's any advantage to taking everything except, you know, taking the rest of the horse away, finding a way to ship that horse to a lab that, or, or a necropsy facility that could get that out for you. That would reduce your exposure. <coughs> yeah, because right. then, the, then the, I'm sorry, because then you'd have to, um, Make sure you've disinfected everything, you know, in your clinic. So, and for cleanup, the rabies virus is is really fragile. Right? Soap and water, but uh, you'd want to use um, alcohol or or bleach, um, and leave on the recommended period of time just to make sure you're inactivating it. Um, and heat uh, will also inactivate.